Greetings all. Thanks for joining. Eddie, are you able to hear me? I am. Okay, good. Well, I'll get right into it. Hello all. Thanks for joining tonight and I'm excited to tell you about what we got going on in the Presidio. Let me see if this share screen works. You seeing that, Eddie? We are from Springs to Bay. Okay, there we go. We're in. Take it away, bro. Well, thanks, uh, CMPS. It's all, they've always been an incredible partner to us on uh, the work we do in the Presidio. And the sharing of knowledge continues um, through all of the partnerships that we have, especially with CMPS. So I um, appreciate the invite. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the entire process of the Tennessee Hollow Watershed Restoration. It's been going on for a long time. Um, and it's, it's a bit of an overview, and I'll pepper in some plant information in there, some interesting plant um, stuff that's happening as well, but it's, it's a bit of a broad sweep through time. So bear with me, um, and I'd love to, love to answer any questions at the end. Uh, let's see here. So I get, there we go. Let's see if I can make this. There we go. Excellent. Um, just a little context. I'm sure many of you already know about this, but uh, just give a little background to those who don't. Um, the Presidio is an almost, almost 15 acre, 1500 acre um, national park. It's a, almost a, a small town within a city. It's where the Golden Gate comes into San Francisco from Marin. Um, it's a national historic landmark with over 400 buildings. Um, and it's really full of incredible biodiversity that is, left over from that period of being an army base. I always love this photograph because it contextualizes so much. Uh, all of us plant people are, look, are used to looking down at the, little, at the stamens and the pistols. And now we get to look down from space and just recognize how much of this area is really urban. And these little pockets of green spaces within that context are an essential part of our well-being and the well-being of all the life that we get to, to live with in the city. Tennessee Hollow is the biggest watershed in the Presidio. It's, about, it's approximately 270 acres, and you can see we're looking from the west here, looking out towards um, Treasure Island and uh, Yerba Buena over, over that way. Um, and it, is, it consists of areas outside the Presidio. You kind of can see that red line actually extends up the hill. If you were to add that to the watershed, that would be accurate. Much of the, the Tennessee Hollow watershed is um, spring-fed. So they're at the central tributary where El Pullen Spring is. And then in the eastern tributary, the springs bubbling out of the ground move their way down through these three tributaries and enter uh, central tributary and then move out towards the bay from there. And I'll give you kind of a, a lowdown of all the little segments along that, that area and what, what's happened over time. Well, interestingly, why is it named Tennessee Hollow? You may not know that it was named after the first Tennessee regiment volunteers, a group of soldiers who made camp in the low ground in 1898, just before shipping out to the Philippines during the Spanish-American War. They were moved over from Camp Merritt, if you're not familiar with that. It was a huge camp that was out in the Richmond district before all of the avenues were there. There was a big chunk of land that a lot of these soldiers were in. And they died that year of, with extraordinary abundance. There was pneumonia, there was yellow fever, and all, you know, they were so packed together in the wet rains um, that they ultimately moved them over here because of that um, in 1898. And it, the, the, the watershed was named after them. Um, and they, they occupied it for many, you know, over a year uh, with tent encampments, the cantonments as they're called. Um, and it later, this whole area later served as temporary housing for those uh, displaced by the 1906 earthquake. This is actually, if you're wondering where this picture is, this is uh, a picture looking from about, if you're familiar with Inspiration Point, down at El Poland Springs below. And just to give you some context, um, 
you know, that we're, they're standing on serpentine grassland and looking down over into the Colma riparian area. Why does it look like it's a kind of a golf course out there? Well, it would probably been mowed by uh, cattle for over, uh, over 75 years at this point. And so the, the landscape, obviously, in the background by 1898 had already been planted with historic forest, and it was still being heavily grazed at this time. Many of you are probably familiar with this image, maybe the first image of San Francisco uh, that we have, take, um, painted by the uh, French artist Louis Chorus, 1816. He was um, one of the, he was an artist on the Rurik expedition. You can see the Rurik down there in the far right corner. The Rurik was a circumpolar um, navigation from Russia that came into harbor or not quite harbor, but they pulled up and rode their rowboat out into the Presidio um, in 1816 and met with the Spanish who had built El Presidio by then. Um, you can see that in the, on the hill here. And we're looking out over the Tennessee Hollow watershed. That little ravine there is where the water would, would run through the central tributary. Note the, some interesting features that Chorus painted into this landscape, um, the, the horses, the cattle, um, and then these pens for animals give you a sense of what this landscape looked like. Um, probably, I think it was spring so that we're seeing that verdant color. You can see that sweep of open sand that tops the hill there of the sand dunes. You can see the lowland areas that would have been rushes and sedges and grasslands, and then the oak uh, woodlands topping the hills. Note the obvious lack of conifers and uh, eucalyptus in this, uh, this picture. Of course, this land was occupied uh, by the Yalama Ohlone prior to the Spanish arriving here. Uh, the Ohlone were living in this land for probably several thousand years um, until the Spanish occupied and basically enslaved these people. As, along with many other native people from the, the surrounding Bay Area. But we, we are familiar, I've always loved this kind of recreation, a reimagination of what um, Ohlone life may have been like um, within these, these systems and how closely they lived, um, making boats and houses out of tulis and harvesting shellfish and hunting and fishing within this area, collecting the bulbs and, and using all the many hundreds of plants that they used as their, as their life. By 1776, the Anza uh, expedition had arrived from Mexico at what would become the Golden Gate and proceeded to establish a fort, which we call the Presidio, on, on Ohlone land. Cows and horses came with them, and it opened up this change that was inexorable that ultimately led to the city that we know today. And we also know that this landscape was full of tule oak, tule elk, deer, mountain lions, and the world's largest grizzly bears. Jump 100 years to this photograph, and we're standing on the top of the Tennessee Hollow watershed looking down at the old salt marsh slough that ran, this would be the, the Chrissy Field um, remnant wetland that ran basically from Fort Point all the way over to the Marina Safeway. We're, we're kind of looking out over that vast plain of, um, of coastal salt marsh. And this picture was taken in 1876, July 3rd, celebrating the centennial of the United States, taken by the famous Carlton Watkins um, and it's showing the sham battle and bombardment, a military review, where hundreds of San Franciscans came out to celebrate the 100-year centenary of the United States. And little did they know that they were staring down in a place that was going to become uh, a part of the Panama Pacific exhibition after the, the earthquake of 1906 that would level this area, fill it, and, tr and uh, forever change it. So jump another 100 years or so to 1972 when the Golden Gate National Recreation Area was created. Um, and in that, you may or may not know, but the Presidio 
was designated that if ever the army was to leave, it would turn over to um, to the National Park Service. And that was the genius of Phil Burton, Amy Meyer, to make sure that they legislated that into the founding legislation of the GGNRA. And in fact, they knew that it was going to happen. Um, by 1994, the army did, in fact, lower its flag. That The Presidio became a national park at that point. It was turned over to the National Park Service. And then, voila, we had the Gingrich Revolution and the beginnings of craziness and, and the continuation of craziness, I should say, in Washington that we are all recovering from today. And I appreciate all of you being here in spite of that. Um, by 1996, we're seeing the signing of the act that created the Presidio Trust. Um, you can see Bill Clinton um, with Nancy Pelosi, a very younger Nancy Pelosi, standing over his shoulder um, as the Presidio Trust, which is the organization I work for, a federal agency that generates its own revenue from the buildings um, throughout the Presidio. And those buildings, by the time the Army left, were in this shape. Um, they were The Army knew they were going to leave and they were not going to invest a lot of money in them. And so things fell into derelict state. They left behind many landfills um, that were contaminated with building remains, heavy metals, and that needed $100 million of cleanup in order to get this place to be a national park. Here's Mountain Lake as it existed in the uh, late 60s. Uh, the Army had pumped all of the lake to irrigate um, the the golf course that was there and it was you know we i guess we are all to blame for all of the sins that we've we've wrought on the earth um, that era was particularly um egregious and we are still recovering from that period of time um and then of the, the historic forest that was planted throughout the presidio was also in a state of significant decline um, often choked with English and Cape Ivy reaching the canopies of blue gum eucalyptus and Monterey pine. We're all familiar with this story. Um, and it was an, an enormous effort that once the Presidio was churned from post to park, we really needed to figure out the extraordinary cost of cleaning up this derelict landscape that we're all familiar with. Here's Chrissy Field as it existed in the um, early 1990s here again. This is a national park site that needed to be renewed and it was gonna take a vision uh, and an enormous amount of money to start to transfer that. So the Presidio Trust, as you may or may not know, was created with the idea that all of the buildings, all of this landscape was going to, was going to cost so much money that, that it would rival the budgets of Yellowstone, Yosemite, um, Grand Canyon combined just to get it up to speed. So the plan came to create this agency, the Presidio Trust, where I work for now, to start them with some founding money to get going on the idea that in 15 years time, we would have been invested with enough money from the federal government to fix up buildings and start the process of renting them out so that we could support ourselves, which is what exactly what happened. One of the great beginnings to the Tennessee Hollow Watershed restoration that was envisioned at the early part of this becoming a national park was of course, Chrissy Field. With the Help Grow Chrissy Field campaign that was led primarily by the Golden Gate National Parks uh, Conservancy, then the association, that raised over $23 million, or 30, excuse me, $34 million mm -hmm primarily from the Haas family, to transform that landscape um, into a, in what the beautiful space that we see today. And we're continuing on with that effort. We started at the bottom of the watershed and we're moving up. Um, just to give you some context about all those changes, you can see in 1942, this exact location um, as Dwight D. Eisenhower in a secondary position, he wasn't even a general at that point, was reviewing the troops in what would become, it was a filled wetland that was then um, restored at, at, as part of the Help Grow Chrissy Field campaign. Um, as soon as the national uh, park was created at the leadership of Sharon Farrell and um, Pete Holleran, seen here, 
and who was at, at the time was uh, the Yerba Buena chapter uh, president of the California Native Plant Society. They saw the future and the opportunity that we had in the Presidio to really seize the moment. And we knew that there was all of this extraordinary biodiversity was, was still hanging on in the open spaces of the Presidio and that had the opportunity to be saved if it was given the vision and the opportunity and funding to, to make that. So the early days of CMPS um, and the work of Jake and Jake Sig, of course, to really inspire the vision for what this national park site could be, it was imperative. And, and I really give a lot of props to CMPS for getting us going on the right direction. Um, the 1996, the Presidio Park Stewards po Program was, was born as, as the first community-based ecological restoration program in the area. Um, as a partnership between NPS, the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, and the newly formed Presidio Trust, we, we, we started the process of doing plant inventories, starting to rescue uh, the, the endangered species that were here. Presidio Clarkia, San Francisco Lysingia, the Ravens Manzanita, and start to rebuild the habitat and spread those species back out by collecting seed, growing and building a native plant uh, nursery system that we have expanded to five sites throughout the GGNRA that are currently run and operated by the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy and that grows over 60,000 plants a year for, for Presidio restoration um, to date. So all of this work to restore the Tennessee Hollow sh watershed couldn't have happened without the extraordinary planning powers um, and the public engagement that comes from these public processes through the National Environmental Policy Act. Presidio Trust Management Plan was one of those extraordinary documents that really set the vision for how and what the Presidio would become. And though mainly hidden today beneath the roadways and storm drains, it says in the Tennessee Hollow Upper Watershed Revitalization Project, yet another environmental document that set the stage for the future of what we could do here. The small areas where it surfaces support some of the most valuable wildlife habitat in San Francisco. Our vision, according to this document, is to revitalize, interpret, and care for the watershed so the future generations can also enjoy it. I can't stress enough the importance of these planning documents to provide inspiration and, and to get public support to do the work that has been enabled um, in these areas. The next project after Chrissy Field was a little further up the, 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 uh, the watershed into Thompson Reach. And you can see the daylighting of a creek here uh, that was formerly an old army landfill, a firing range that the army had set up and, and to use to shoot and fire in that area. Um, and the first you know, real creek daylighting that we, uh, we were able to accomplish back in 2004 with the removal of the landfill and the reestablishment of the creek that by the way, we've now named Petlanuk Creek after the Ohlone village that is still in existence um, in the ground under um, the, at, at the bottom of the watershed at, at Chrissy Field. So running through the Tennessee hollow shed is now Petlanuk Creek. And you can see the waters as they're first being daylighted here in Thompson Reach in 2004. Here it is in the landscape. You can see Chrissy Field to the north. This little patch of green that's set amongst the hardscape and the urban uh, landscape that is the Presidio is now a thriving uh, spot that is um, over 15 years old now. Many of you were probably out here um, witnessing this first kickoff day in 2004 where we planted over 2,000 native riparian plants um, in, the, in the freshly excavated area. Um, part of what we've tried to do all along is to bring as many people into this process as possible and engage hearts and minds in the dirt and to really build a community around this work. So just to give you a, a picture of this transformation, here's uh, Thompson Reach as it existed as a landfill um, in 2003. And I'm just gonna guide you through the process of how landscapes like this become transformed. 
Here it is, the excavation of that landfill being harvested out and removed to landfill, the daylighting of a creek, a lot of willow, native arroyo willows planted along the, the bank's edge, and as, as well as 80 other native species growing in our nursery, growing up over time till by what they look like today. Now, if you were walked there by, by this time, you might not know that that uh, landscape was any at any other time anything but what it is today. And that's kind of the goal of all of this, is to try to bring back as much of this natural habitat such that people may, may have no idea what was there before. Some of the species that are make up some of these things, um, I realize I'm in a CMPS talk, so I got to make sure I get some good some of the good plants in here. And that particular um, that particular site, Arroyo willows, our native willow, one of two species in the Presidio, um, this is the dominant one, was used abundantly to basically hold the creek in place so that it didn't meander like typical natural creeks do. We used um, a lot of live willow stakes to bundle. Uh, and stake is, and as many of you know, you, you stake a, a piece of willow in the ground and it has the capacity to root and grow on its own, which is, we did a lot of that in the Thompson Reach area. We planted other important species like red alder that are now very big and dominant and providing extraordinary habitat for the birds that are in there. Of course, red osier dogwood. But like I said, there, there are over 80 species of native plants in there. That transformation has led to extraordinary changes in terms of bird diversity. Our program has attempted to track all of these changes in all of our projects and our restoration projects. And we work with Point Blue Conservation Science to do that and track these species. And we, we, we typically focus on the focal species for any particular habitat. Those are the species as you probably know, that need that particular habitat in order to survive. They're not generalists, they really need these habitats. And here's just four examples of, um, of some focal species that have really thrived uh, since the restoration of uh, this riparian community in Thompson Reach. Notice that Wilson warbler that dropped out there. We're not sure why that happened but we have observed that it has come back since then and it's also one of these incredible focal species that has um, really benefited from our restoration. So I'm working our way up the creek. Um, here's El Poland Springs. Um, you may, many of you have probably visited this area. It's where the central tributary of Tennessee Hollow bubbles out of the ground in multiple locations. Um, here it is um, in the 1950s. A lot of stonework up there, as you can see the ladies um, that are sitting around these serpentine boulders that were placed by the WPA, that's the Works Prog Progress Administration in the 1930s that constructed a lot of the hardscape and national parks throughout the country. Um, that's actually not the spring at all, it's just a fake spring that the spring runs through on the way down. Um, it, these springs were considered by the Spanish to be um, springs of fertility. Um, the first, one of the first inhabitants um, that was not Ohlone, one of the first uh, Spanish-Mexican uh, settlers that lived right here on the banks of, of the central tributary was the great Juana Briones, who built um, uh, her house out of adobe bricks. And you can see in that picture to the right, um, a group of Stanford archaeologists working with us to excavate and unearth um, the house that Juana Briones raised her many children in um, and built her empire of cattle grazing that we all, uh, if you travel through the Bay Area, you will see signs of the name Briones all over um, that are homage to her and the extraordinary um, work that she did to build a, you know, build a land uh, empire in, in California. Here it is, um, El Poland Spring, as it existed in, I think this is around 2007, where we started to remove and get rid of over, um, you know, 80 to 90 large blue gum eucalyptus trees from the surrounding landscape and start to transform this place that was choked with other invasive species like gorse, Cape Ivy, 
invasive of Monterey pines and start the process to transform this landscape back to a native landscape. If you go to El Poland Spring today, it doesn't even look like this. This is what it looked like several years after the, the wetlands were recreated at El Poline and that landscape that was blocked to the south from the tall blue gums was uh, transformed. It too is now a thriving place. And many of our, uh, many of you birders found yourselves here looking for all sorts of the, um, the vagrants that move through here, as well as these um, Anna's hummingbird, or Alan's hummingbirds um, drinking from the springs. Um, YMCH, YMCA reach as we move downstream is what uh, an area right here is, that was known as the Dust Bowl in the Presidio, another three acre area in this, what I consistently call this kind of string of pearls of, of wetland restoration that follows, um, that we're restringing this, this uh, watershed. YMCA reach um, was also uh, put into a pipe by the army um, and, and basically covered in asphalt and became a dumping ground for many years um, when we were doing a lot of the work that we needed to do to clean up these landfills and to rehab buildings. It was a place that we needed for a while until we didn't need it anymore. Um, here is where it's located. It's just um, near the YMCA, if you're familiar with that. Um, in 2013, I believe 2014, we began excavation as one of many projects that we got uh, San Francisco airport mitigation funding for wetlands that the airport had to destroy by FDA regulations in order to create a rumble strip at the end of their runways. They filled in what were considered Army Corps jurisdictional wetlands, but were none other than just wet ditches um, that they had to mitigate for. And we were the beneficiaries of that work at this site, um, as well as some of the other sites I'm gonna show you in a second. Um, many millions of dollars, $7 million was given to the Presidio to restore these wetlands to mitigate for those ditches that the um, that the um, our, the airport had to create, and we started the act of planting um, in 2014. You can see the creek daylighted here, flowing with the with January rains, beautifully designed with these pinning logs that hold held the creek in place because it's not a purely natural landscape. Um, we need we had to protect hardscape. We have to protect fiber optic lines that are in here. So we had to kind of confine some of this into spaces using rock and, and logs and plants to hold that into space. Um, by 2019, this, this site is a beautiful example of a different kind of uh, riparian corridor that's it's still developing its, um, its habitat with species like Carex of Nupta, uh, Slough Sedge, um, soft rush like Juncus effusus, um, and then another rush, the I Irish leaf rush. These are all abundant in that landscape. And unlike the previous example where I showed you at Thompson Reach, which, which is now dense riparian corridor, we've taken a slower approach here at YMCA Reach to allow for this more herbaceous um, rush and um, uh, scrub landscape to establish. And we're slowly, slowly seeing plants like wax myrtle and red osier dogwood fill in this space. We're, we're, so we're taking a more um, timed approach with succession at these sites to allow for the development of a good um, wetland understory so that when these willows and other woody species move in, they'll have a beautiful understory here. Yet another landscape, MacArthur Meadow, just up the, the reach from YMCA was another in this string of pearls funded by San Francisco Airport mitigation funding. Um, and here we are at our annual planting day in 2015, where we planted over 3000 plants and over, had over 150 people out there um, helping to get plants in the ground. This is a great story of um, uh, an endangered species that we've been working to restore in this particular site. Um, here's the type specimen. One of the, um, the, the species was first 
described to science here in the Presidio in the, in the early 1900s. Um, it is called marsh sandwort or Arenaria polluticola. Um, Lustrine was its name when it was first described to science. It was found in the freshwater marshes uh, that fringed the salt marsh, the seasonal wetlands at the base of Fort Point. Um, since that time, all of the wetlands from Washington down to uh, Baja, California, where this species um, once found its home. So it's a beautiful creeping plant that finds its way up through um, water parsley and persicaria, if you're familiar with those plants. It's, it's a, a gentle, delicate creeper that is now so critically endangered, there's maybe nine individuals left in the world that are now restricted in the wild to the Oso Flaco dunes down in San Luis Obispo and the, the um, floating um, dune slacks down there. The Fish and Wildlife Service has been slowly spreading those nine individuals clonally into wetland habitats. And we were really honored to bring it back um, to this site um, about five years ago, um, to bring it back to the Presidio where it was first described as science. It has not gone well. This species is very delicate and, and clearly needs very particular habitat. And we're getting some to establish. We've tried it in a variety of locations, but it is, it's not an easy one to get back. And they've had better success across the bridge and, um, and Rodeo Valley up in that way, Garbodi Valley, um, where it's a little bit more wet. So here we, we come to today where we find the great Quartermaster Reach project that just, we've almost finished planting and this is a rendering um, of what we hope it will look like in the, in the years to come. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to take some pictures of what it looks like today, but if you hadn't had a chance to get out there and check it out, that bridge is in existence and you can walk over the moving tidal wetland there's six new acres of tidal wetlands that are now connected under Mason Street. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving here by these two large box culverts that connect the bay water at Chrissy Lagoon into this new tidal area. Um, and we've now planted over 23,000 plants, individuals of, of salt marsh plants, um, and all, as well as brackish plants. This site, unlike Chrissy Field, has a much greater potential to harbor some of the very productive species of brackish um, uh, salt marsh plants that typically are, you know, one of the most productive um, environments uh, in, in any ecosystem. Um, and they're doing well. So just to give you a little sense of this, the transformation of this landscape, what you're looking at here is the U U.S. Coast Geodetic Survey from 1869 that shows the extensive um, salt and, and freshwater landscape that extended from Fort Point all the way over to what is now the Marina Green, Black Point being Fort Point there now. And you can see that lobe over here as um, what is was known formerly as Strawberry Island. And I'll show a photo of what that looked like in the past. That was one of the barrier beach dunescapes that protected the inland salt marshes um, that, that ran and the fringing seasonal freshwater wetlands. This is approximately the habitat where that um, marsh sandwort was discovered to science um, and it was ultimately filled and lost as all of, almost all of its habitat through uh, Seattle down to Baja has been. A little close up um, on this landscape of what the slough looked like with that barrier beach. You can see the areas in green here are the salt marsh areas. That sand colored area is the, the former Strawberry Island it was, as it was known, the barrier beach. And the tan color is the upland, the bluff that ran along there. And I recently found um, through some partnership work with the San Francisco Estuary Institute, have been doing a great project on historical ecology of the northern stretch of San Francisco. There's a great quote from Hans Hermann Baer that if you're not familiar, was an amateur scientist, but he was a doctor and did a lot of the early botanizing in San Francisco and described this area 
that was basically a kind of a little bit of a bluff edge that dropped precipitously down into the marshland. And he described the plant community there um, that was a thicket of uh, Garia elliptica, silk, silk tassel, um, uh, blue alder, elderberry, and uh, uh, California bay. And so that's been an inspiration for us at this project to really bring back some of those species and to try to recreate on that bluff's edge where we have the opportunity here at Quartermaster Reach to focus on bringing back, especially the Garia and the, um, the elderberry in that area. So here it is after the Panama Pacific exhibition filled this area after the 1906 earthquake had filled it. And you can see the Palace of Fine Arts, the last bit of open water that was a remnant of that former landscape. And I'm just going to give you a sense of this air photo that was taken in the 1940s when the army had fully moved out into that spot and overlay exactly with geolocation where that uh, former area looked. I'm just going to toggle that for a second. And you can see this incredible hardscape and urban space that we're now re, um, rediscovering back in that landscape and stitching back in amongst the hardscape that is there. Another view of that same area, we're looking down at, um, at this barrier beach that was known as Strawberry Island. It was for, for the Fregaria chiloensis that was dominant out on the, on the barrier beach there. And you can see the extent of the salt marsh that extended from Fort Point all the way through here at high tide. That's why it's all flooded. You can't see the channel at this moment. And you're, we're standing looking from basically Fort Point, which was then called Black Point, um, with these open sand sheets. Here below us is Washerwoman Lagoon, which is now approximately where the Marina Safeway is. This area was, as we know, full of these seasonal wetlands, um, dune slacks, ponds, and lakes that are no longer part of the landscape. And of course, the vast dune sheet that extended from Ocean Beach up from this photograph um, and uh, all the way across to basically downtown where the high rises are today. The last ve vestiges of these, uh, these sand dune systems are really in the Presidio and little bits at Ocean Beach and at Fort Funston. So here is the excavation of Quartermaster Reach of several months ago, right when we started digging. And you can really see the layers of history the ecological history here in particular, you see this incredible bay muds. This is this was the, the geology of the former landscape that was that, um, that former salt marsh that were, were consisting of bay muds overtopped by aerial deposited and ocean deposited um, sand dune uh, features. And we're digging right into that historical past and using that important substrate to build these plant communities that we're in the process of recreating today. Of course, we've seen the transformation already. This, we've been doing this for over 20 years and turning these derelict sites back into places for people, for students, and for extraordinary um, abundance of wildlife um, that are coming back into that area. Just a comparison of what this area looks like from Thompson Reach over here into the uh, a rendering of what um, Quartermaster Reach will soon look like in the years ahead as it connects up here to, to Chrissy Field compared to what it looked like just a few weeks ago. Um, even though this is 2016, there's been construction for many years over there. Just another interesting story. It's not a plant story, but it's a good one. Um, one of the things we're parting, we're, we're trying to do as part of this project is bring back uh, native Olympia oysters into the Quartermaster Reach area. Olympia oysters, um, there are several accounts which indicate that oysters were once highly abundant in San Francisco Bay. Townsend wrote that native oysters were ever accumulating on the shelves of live, large eastern oysters, which were planted in the bay around the 1870s. So many natives settled and farmed oysters that were thought to interfere with the growth of eastern oysters. So the Olympia natives were kind of getting in the way of these fatter eastern oysters that were brought in. Um, and that settlement on cultivated oysters by the remarkably fertile, fertile native oysters naturally adapted to SF Bay 
was so great, Townsend wrote, that when a heap of Eastern oysters have been cleaned for market, the accumulated parasites almost equal in bulk the edible species. So um, what you're seeing here is some of the old uh, oyster beds that were created in various parts of San Francisco Bay to grow um, these Eastern, Eastern oyster beds. And the, the native Olympias just jumped on top of them. And so we know they were here, they, they're important ecosystem engineers. And as part of this project, we are attempting to bring them back into this area and integrate them into the hardscape as well as into the tidal areas um, that, that flow through these hardscapes. So that these culverts here have some really interesting features. We've built them so that they have rough surfaces that oysters and other um, benthic or organisms and intertidal organisms can attach onto and help um, establish um, you know, filtering in this area and try to rebuild some of this um, former landscape back into the, the estuary system. We're also building oyster balls from shells that were collected through many um, trips to San Francisco restaurants for over five years. You can see back in the corner here, this giant mound of shells that we've collected to build these many oyster balls that are going and that are already been placed into this quartermaster reach underwater. We're also working with a great group at the California College of the Arts, the Architectural Ecologies Group, that is experimenting with incredible um, 3D printed uh, fiberglass forms that are lightweight, that support extraordinary abundance of diversity. And we did some, some real prototyping in Christy Lagoon to see that as this a test, uh, a, a, a basically a test case to see if we could get in oysters. And indeed we did, you can see these things in the background there that are covered with all sorts of organisms, some native, some not, but we, we found that there were abundance of uh, oysters that were settling naturally on here. And here's a story about that that was written in the Chronicle um, earlier this year. There's John Young, who's leading our efforts on that way to really um, experiment with this. And we, we, we're hoping to learn a lot about what can happen um, as we continue forward, um, as the, the seawall, I don't know if some of you may have seen that some funding has really recently come in to move forward with rebuilding the infrastructure that's gonna help us adapt to climate change. Much of what is coming hopefully will integrate green solutions into those hardscape areas so that we have um, really thriving uh, ecosystems on the edge of these mitigated uh, seawall areas that are protect us from climate change. So we've come a long way. Um, we've we've gone backwards and we're we're trying to bring forward. So this great wild in the city map that we now see um, the last vestiges of some of these little habitats that we find here in the Presidio and obviously at the Tennessee Hollow watershed. So many of us are working on this and I appreciate and applaud everybody that's out there doing this in their way, whether it's in their backyards or it's in the little places that we can really bring back this uh, extraordinary biodiversity and make our, our areas better for everybody. Um, shout out to another species, uh, Liam uh, uh, O'Brien wanted me to shout this one out, Western Tail Blue is a particular species that we hope to see um, coming back into these areas. It's a, it's a rare butterfly that is, hasn't been seen much um, in the in, in the county. Um, and so like all of this work, the Presidio and our partners at the National Park Service and our partners at, at the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, you know, this is how we do it. Renewing the landscape is a, an important part of engaging the people of San Francisco into our work. Measuring our success is a really important part of that engaging the community through student groups and volunteers and educating kids along the way. All of this is what we have to do in order to engender this ethic of bringing back wild places into our, our landscapes throughout San Francisco. And we can have places that look like this at the top of the Tennessee Hollow watershed where the restored serpentine grasslands at Inspiration Point 
are a magical place in the spring with over 150 species of native plants um, are thriving in beautiful wild gardens of the past. Um, just a couple shout outs. If you're interested, um, there's a Tennessee Hollow Watershed Walk that you can down, download from the Presidio Trust website. Just email, uh, search on Google for Presidio Self-Guided Hikes and the Tennessee Hollow Watershed Walk if you wanna explore this on your own with a little self-guided uh, interpretation of all these sites and more that I showed today. And I wanna just give an enormous shout out to these two gentlemen who I had the honor on uh, uh, New Year's Eve to take out and walk around through this, this watershed. Um, incredible applause to Dan Glusenkamp for all the incredible work he's done with CMPS to get this organization where it is today and to pass the baton on to everyone that's going to take it into the future. And, and he's done an amazing amount to, to extend this work all over the state of California. And of course, Jake Sig, who really, without his inspiration and guidance and early pioneering work, we wouldn't be able to do the kinds of stuff that we're doing um, in the Presidio today without his vision and his early activism around that. So much appreciated to those two gentlemen. And finally, another opportunity, we're all virtual these days. If you'd like to explore some of these changes a little bit more closely, um, I encourage you to check out the Presidio Time Machine. Um, that's the link there. If you simply Google Presidio Time Machine, you can um, interact with um, a reef photography project that I've worked on over the last many years to really demonstrate these changes, historic changes through time that the restoration work has brought to this landscape. There's a lot of information, great interactive uh, photographs there and spoken narratives from many of the people here in the Presidio to tell the story there. And that's it. Thank you so much for uh, listening and um, joining me tonight. Appreciate people coming out. Far out, Lou. That was beautiful, man. That uh, timeline of Thompson Reach, that's just absolutely magical. Can I get that? <laughs> I, I, I can get that for you, yeah. I'm going to just put that on my screen and leave it as a <laughs> saver. It's just amazing. How long was that over like a two-year period? The Tennessee Hollow Watershed? Yeah, where you the where it had the uh, the timeline. Oh, that timeline um, was from 2003 till 2012. So that oh. that time lapse, um, you know, we as part of that Presidio time machine, which I just showed there, we've um, set up photo points in all our sites where we can precisely go back to those same locations and create those animations that tell the story of this cha change. It's hard to see those changes um, without doing that. So that's, that's, a tw that's about a seven year time span on that one. Very cool, man. I mean, it's amazing how steady it is. You know, that must've really locked that camera in somehow. I got a whole talk on how to do that. Okay, cool. Hey, um, um, you got time for a few questions? We're absolutely, hoping. absolutely. Uh, I had neglected. I'm, I've gotten so used to doing these Zooms that I forget not everyone uh, is as familiar. And I forgot to mention that uh, we, you know, we welcome anyone's questions in the chat or the Q&A. We can uh, monitor both of those. And uh, there's a few of them in there now. Um, also, I completely forgot to mention that uh, we are now offering uh, for landscape architects uh, ISA CEU credits for uh, for joining our speaker programs and uh, our uh, awesome volunteer Alex Harker, who's been working with with us on the Petrero Eco Patch. She's uh, designed the Petrero Eco Patch, Petrero Gateway Eco Patch. Um, that is along Vermont Street, and uh, it's an experimental um, native, all native, all San Francisco native uh, garden that we're uh, that we've been working with and hoping to use that as a model 
um, for, for future projects. And she is a landscape architect with the Field Collective and she put that together for us. So if you are a landscape architect and you're, you've heard about this program, uh, please do share your name uh, and your CEU number or whatever that is uh, on the chat. And um, so one of the first uh, questions we've got, Lou, is uh, uh, from Victor and he asked, um, what was the public sentiment and then the general emotion of the planners at the formative time in the 90s and, and, and double lots and have things changed significantly as the progress has been shown? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we'd already come a long way by the time this started getting going and a lot, of, a lot had already happened in, in other places. And I think this, this kind of movement of community-based restoration was just catching on and starting to build steam. And there was, you know, so many people in San Francisco that were recognizing that this was a moment that we really needed to take it to the next level um, by bringing nature back in our urban spaces. And so those documents in the planning process um, were supported by many of you and others that really came to the table and to the public meetings to say, yes, this is the vision that we want and we are gonna write letters and we're gonna support that. Um, but you, you know, there were a lot of others that didn't have that feeling at the time. There, you know, people did not like tree removals. They did not like interfering with the way that they had built their recreational opportunities in there. So we all know that these processes are, that's, this, is, this is the seed of democracy right here. When you get down to it, this is where it happens. And um, there's a lot of opinions and there's a process. And that's, that's been really exciting to watch. And I think, you know, a lot of the skeptics that thought, you know, maybe taking a bunch of trees out wasn't a good idea have changed their opinions uh, because it's a different kind of beauty. It's a beauty that is more reflective of a San Francisco that existed before all of the European and changes that came along. So to answer your question, I'd say people have, have been willing to come along with us. And I think we've, we've gotten a lot of people um, excited about the work. And if you go to places like Alpaline, or you go out to Baker Beach and see the dunescapes out there, you viscerally experience that. I mean, it's a feeling that you're in an, a wild place. And that is a feeling that we all really, you know, get, I think. And as, as the more we see the, the successes of this, I think we can ask and demand more of it for, throughout the rest of the city and say, and, and I'll, I'll point out, these things are not inexpensive. You know, these, this is expensive work and it takes people, philanthropists, it takes creative fundraising to bring these places back into the city. And, it, you know, it's a value system. And we, we are in a time in, in the world where, we're valuing bringing this stuff back into our and into our cities. Great answer, Lou. That's uh, and thanks. I, we're grateful that the uh, Presidio has been so open to receiving our comments. Um, and uh, kind of along those same lines, Jennifer was uh, had kind of a, a wider open question about uh, the de decision on which plants get planted and. Um, was wondering if because of climate change that uh, plants outside of this area are uh, being considered in anticipation of Great that. question, great question. Um, so, so in anticipation of climate change, we really don't quite know what's gonna happen, right? We, we have a sense we, and we've seen broad model changes that we're gonna lose some of our stuff and things are gonna need to shift. Um, to the degree that we try to anticipate future changes, we're just starting to move in that direction. And, and it's the Presidio Trust, it's the Golden Gate National uh, Parks Conservancy, it's the National Park Service. And we're, we're trying to figure out a way forward for the future of where do we collect our seed from? And, and maybe we go to areas that already have the climate future that we will inherit in 50 years to get different genotypes into the system. Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're obviously thinking a lot about it. And, you know, we, we anticipate that, that 
climate change is a nuanced thing. Not everything is going to change. It's, you know, certain areas will be protected and so, certain won't. And, and so we're, we're proceeding currently with the remnant pieces of native habitat and plants that still exist in the Presidio, but we're starting to consider um, genetic diversification from areas outside of here in anticipation of those climate futures. But I will, will add just a, an additional thing, all of the work that we've done so far in, in so far as our native rewilding area, the, the restoration sites have been built uh, on the over 400 species of native plants that we know were here and are still here to some degree. Um, from that Rurik expedition to all the many Cal Academy botanists through the 1800s that identified these places and, um, and, and or we're, we're amplifying those bits of leftover habitat that are still here and plants. Cool. A um, uh, question from Dale. Do you have any examples of how plant species that uh, make quartermaster reach look different from the Chrissy Field Lagoon? Great question. Um, I, and I apologize for not sharing a little bit more of, of what, what's coming in there. Um, from afar, you won't really notice much of a difference with maybe this, the exception of plants like alkali heath. Um, so some of these taller rushes, um, Bobul shonus meridimus, is, which is a classic uh, brackish uh, tidal species. They're a little bit taller. They're not pickleweed. They're not saltgrass. Um, we'll have some of those. We have plants like Lysimichia, if you're fam familiar with that. It's a beautiful little plant. That's a, it's another brackish plant. Um, there are some really good examples of species that we haven't been able to have because we haven't had the habitat, and those are some of them that are um, coming in. There's a Baccarus, Baccarus glutinosa, that's related to coyote bush, which is a, more of a forb that's another one of these species. So we, we have about 10 brackish species that we've brought into the system, anticipating that the groundwater here is higher. Um, there's going to be more inputs of fresh water. We don't know where it's totally going to be and how the mixing is going to occur, but we're, we put them in. Cool. Um, something a little more specific from uh, Vernon. Uh, do you know about the Arenaria paluticola that was uh, planted some years ago northwest of Rodeo Lagoon? I do. Um, there's a couple sites out there. There's one near the Surfer's Lot, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it was a wetland restoration that the National Park Service did. Uh, it's going on 10 years now, I think. That's one site, um, and that's a restoration site. And they've, I think they've had modest success with that site, but the best site um, is in Gerbodi Valley in, um, you know, right off, I think it's the Miwok Trail maybe, um, as you're going down Rodeo Valley, there's a spectacular successful site out there that's been really uh, alive and well. That's the best site I've seen um, as part of these restorations so far. Cool. Uh, from Adrian, uh who says the work is super inspiring. Uh, what does the maintenance efforts look like going forward? Uh, super interested in the underwater artificial reefs or a project over in Oakland. Is there oh, a call cool. you might be able to share? For yeah, Adrian? absolutely. So in terms of maintenance, um, what we find, and I'll just hold my hand up here, you know, the effort starts here. If the effort's up on this axis and time is over here, we see a really fast decay on the amount of work that we need to put on these things. So we, we start with a lot of work and then it establishes and we really drop off if we do these projects right. That doesn't mean we're, we're not coming back to chase invasives that get in there. And sometimes we have to prune to keep some of the natives from jumping over into the hardscape. But yes, our goal with all of this is to be as self-sufficient as possible and to have to do as minimal amount of maintenance and we've been pretty successful on that front. Um, but that doesn't mean there's no maintenance, right? Um, there's always, when you're dealing with an urban landscape, you're gonna have, you're gonna have, to, you're gonna have to cut things and keep, keep them in check. Um, to your question about, uh, I think Oakland, um, that I, you may be referencing that same group that we're working with, the Arche Arche Architectural Ecologies Group, they um, deployed a what they call the float lab, which is a in, it's a fiberglass kind of floating structure that's another prototype 
that's built with fiberglass with lots of contours um, to basically do the same thing that we're doing um, at Quartermaster Reach to, to, to actually, you know, they, they got the idea that um, they had a grad student that was like, had a side job cleaning boats and realizing that fouling organisms that are constantly getting on the undersides of boats were a problem. And he, he was paid as he was a grad student cleaning them off. And they thought, you know, what if, what if we took that and, and manipulated it with fiberglass and, and tried to experiment with building these structures so that they had nooks and crannies and openings that would support the native organisms that are having a harder time in the bay. And so there's a lot of really great innovation that those guys are doing around this subject. And I think it has a lot of potential when we think about the, the coming seawall work. Um, and that's, that's one of my motivations for doing it here. We're not going to make an enormous habitat change by this, but by our experimenting and learning, we can hopefully apply some of this stuff to the rest of San Francisco Bay going forward. And, and this next question, <laughs> you might even be able to guess who it's from. Lou, how do we scale up this biodiversity work to save the world? <laughs> good, good seeing you, Dan, hearing from you, Dan Glusenkamp. And we miss you, man. <laughs> Dan and I have been scheming a lot about how to how to get this bigger. And, um, you know, I think we're in an amazing moment right now where there's a recognition from people that you wouldn't expect to be recognizing this stuff. I, I, I uh, wat, sat on a, I uh, read a report and sat on a long pod, you know, a, a Zoom meeting with Dave Paulson, the former... Um, you know, Secretary of Treasury under the Bush administration and and then into the early part of the Obama administration. The Paulson Institute has devoted an enormous, in his retirement, I wouldn't have guessed this, he's, he's going all in on funding conservation for the 21st century. Um, there's big money coming towards this problem, not only from climate change, but from from nature. And so I, many of us have been, you know, we came up in the 90s or earlier where there was no money for this. And now suddenly there's there's giant financier, financiers in on this. So, you know, it's it's an interesting time. And I think it's it's a really uh, a moment where many of us who've been working on these small scales are trying to picture how does how does all this money coming into the game um, affect us and how can we guide it to, to the best solution? So we'll see. Cool. So uh, a, a practical question from Richard Turner. A lot of soil was excavated uh, uh, along the course of Tennessee Hollow. Where did that soil go? Great question. Um, many of our landfills became landfills. Um, in this case, is no different. If you're familiar with much of the restoration work that's going on throughout the broader San Francisco Bay Area, there, you know, there's a need for, for material and soils to get them into those places. They, in, in order to compensate and get ahead of, of sea level rise, we have this urgent need to get on some of these bigger wetland restorations, especially in the North and South Bay. And we can't do it with passive actions alone. We need material and soil. And that's, that's the biz, biggest expense of these projects is dealing with moving earth and getting rid of it. And, in, and unfortunately, in our case, in this most recent project, we had to pay to get rid of that stuff. And that, that is something that we don't wanna be doing in the future when we do these projects. We wanna integrate our work with as much of this, um, you know, when you're excavating, let's bring it over to another site that needs the soil if it can. But in our case, we, we were dealing with some contaminated soils, right? from the legacy of the army. And so we had to get rid of it. We had to put it in another landfill in order to, uh, we, we couldn't use that stuff. Cool. And uh, so it sounds like you maybe you've sort of already answered this, but maybe you want to expand on it a little bit more. Has some of the historical photos helped convince skeptics to allow restoration to proceed? Sounds like yes. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's, that's my goal. Um, to, but I, I'd say it's more to inspire. Um, I think we've we've had success in, in bringing people that skeptics along. 
and I, I, I view it more as a way that we can, how do we do more of this? How can we show each other that this is possible and it's worth spending the money and fundraising to do? Um, and I think, you know, that's just one way of, of being able to get that, that inspiration out there. Yeah, and all you got to do is go out to Chrissy and oh my, there's a lot of inspired people walking around out there and jogging and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, so, and so just kind of, uh, using the information you're collecting from a historical ecology perspective, uh, any, any tips on how we can, we can use it? I mean, you, I, obviously you're keeping careful track of what works and what doesn't work. Um, I know we're doing that in some of our, you know, some yeah. of our Yerba Buena projects. It's, we're a little uh, not not very experienced at it, but we're we're getting there. Um, do you are you establishing some methodology for uh, for evaluating as you go? Yeah, absolutely, um, and you know part of what part of it is you know when we talk about historical ecology, part of that is knowing what was there and. We're, we often think about the plants when we do that, but 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 you before to rebuild these plant communities, you have to start from below the plants with soil, and getting the soil right is imperative in order to get these these plant communities established. You can fake it too. I mean, you can get hybrid um, soils that grow, and we're doing that in another project right next to Quartermaster Reach, where we're basically building soil. Um, on top of this project, the, it's called the Tunnel Tops, which is a Dolores Park sized new, basically uh, park that's gonna connect the main post down to Chrissy Field. And so we're planting over 150 species of natives in that place, an additional 150 species of Mediterranean plants from around the world are going in there. So you can, manipulate and create these soils. It's expensive and it's something you have to do, but getting the soil right is important. Um, choosing the right species that will work in these landscapes and areas that we can do is important. Um, and, and, and identifying, you know, where the opportunity spots are, where, where the wetlands were, where we could, you know, bring some of this stuff back and, and, and the historical ecology can contribute to um, making those decisions and helping plan those things. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, well, we're, we're looking forward to seeing how things continue to progress over there. It's, it's really exciting for San Franciscans and the, the whole Bay Area, really. And uh, lots of people are enjoying it. So thanks so much, Lou. We, we, uh, it's so good to see you this way. At, but really looking forward to the day when we can see you in person indeed and uh, just just to plug you know once covid is over and we're starting to and and i just want to give a shout out to all our volunteers who've been coming back out and really making a huge contribution during covid um we we really look forward to getting people back in the field and being together as we do this work so here's to that day yeah bro. Thanks again, and thanks to everyone for joining up in this way. We had almost 100 people uh, join us tonight, and, uh, and uh, we'll be back here on February 4th. Join us then. Good seeing you. Thanks, Lou. Bye, guys.